The next uh, presentation is going to be on uh, UPC and UPC++ programming models. It's going to be a bit of a tag team presentation. Uh, we have uh, one speaker, Kathy Alec, right in the corner over there. Uh, she's, uh, she couldn't come here, so she's going to give a video talk uh, for about 30 minutes. And then we're going to have, we'll switch over to uh, uh, Amir Kamel, who is somewhere oh, here, <laughs> who will be uh, uh, talking about uh, the rest of the uh, the course for 30 minutes each, uh, we'll be covering that. So Kathy is the Associate Lab Director at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. She was uh, one of the inventors of UPC and uh, also has been a big promoter of PGAS models in general. And uh, uh, Amir Kamel is a systems engineer at uh, Lawrence Berkeley and also has an appointment at uh, University of Michigan. So um, who's going first? Is Kathy going first? All right, Kathy, you're up. All right, well, I'm very sorry. I, I couldn't be there in person, but um Thanks very much for um, including me. I, I, I have been there for the last several years, but, um, and uh, so as, it, as Pavan said, Amir and I will sort of tag team this and um, talk just a little bit about UPC. And actually, um, uh, Amir has really been working um, as part of the UPC++ team um, to redesign UPC++. So he'll talk about where that is going, because I think there's some, uh, a bunch of lessons learned from the UPC experience, which um, they're feeding into UPC++. Um, so this class of um, languages, PGAS languages, um, I think it's best to motivate them by an example of something that is, um, is hard to write in uh, a send-receive model. And I will apologize up front. I'll try to be careful about this, um, but, but I'll, I will sometimes refer to MPI or message passing um, as a two-sided uh, thing, which is not true, as I'm sure you've heard about MPI it does have one-sided features, but I'm going to just kind of compare uh, this PGAS model to a two-sided send and receive model. So the programming problem I want you to think about for a minute here is um, the problem of building a histogram. So let's say that you've got a very large number, a million words or something like that. They're streaming in from someplace else, um, and you want to count the number of words that have a given property. Um, so the simplest thing would be just count all the words that start with the letter A, B, etc. Um, and uh, so, so, so now we just need a, um, a histogram of you know, 26 buckets, and each one is just going to contain a, an integer counter. Uh, there'll have to be some kind of a lock, or you'll have to use atomics um, in order to update this um, to, to avoid race conditions. But um, it, it, if, this, um, if this data structure was very large, um, so let's say that it's not something that the, the number of things that you want to count um, the, the size of the bucket is not just 26, but is something that doesn't even fit in the memory of a single shared, a single node on your supercomputer, then you want to spread out this histogram. And, um, and now the problem is that each processor is, say, reading a substream of all of these words that are coming in, and it wants to somehow send a plus one um, to the whatever processor owns a particular bucket. So it needs to have some kind of a hash function or whatever that tells it for a given word. Um, in this case, it's the simple one that says take off the first character. Of course, then it's not such a huge uh, array. But in the case where it is a, a huge array, it sends it to the processor that owns, say, the A through C uh, parts of the A's and B parts of the bucket. And um, the problem is that the processor that is that owns that bucket doesn't really have any code that says um, receive uh, this this um, message from another processor because it doesn't know which processor might be sending to and or that even this event might be happening right now because there might be other other things going on in the system. So the idea is to be able to do something one sided that is to update the memory on the remote side. Um, read and write is the simplest. In this case, we had an atomic um, in order to an atomic update in order to um, uh, affect what's stored on the memory on the other side without necessarily involving, um, say, a full fledged computation on the other side. So um, the goals of the PGAS programming model, as they're called, these partition global address space languages, is to support applications um, that are very irregular. They have things like graphs, hash tables, sparse matrices, um, or um, maybe adaptive meshes that are very um, that are very irregular in shape and therefore harder to, to um, parallelize in kind of the, the ways that are easiest, the do domain decomposition approaches that are used for um, a lot of say, more regular meshes, even, say, uh, unstructured meshes where you partition the graph. Um, the other motivation is really to expose the best available performance on a given machine. Um, and so this is going to be about um, having low latency for small messages, but it's also going to be a lot, a lot of it will be about 
maximizing the ability to do overlap, overlap communication with computation, overlap communication with, um, with other communication. That is what we sometimes call it communication pipelining and also um, be able to get very, um, very efficient messaging and then to use it well by overlapping it with, um, with uh, other, other things that are going on in the system. So here's the kind of cartoon of what a PGAS language looks like. It's called a partition of global address space um, in the sense that it, what, what does it mean to have a global address space? It means that a thread can directly read and write remote data. So the histogram example was an um, example of this. Uh, you could imagine that with, if we ignore the lock issue for a minute, that you're just doing a remote read of a value, um, the processor increments it and then does a remote write of that value. And so you want the convenience of shared memory for some of these large complex um, data structures that aren't easy to just sort of think about what's my local array. Um, so here in this picture, we have uh, the shared part of the memory space is in yellow. And um, there's a linked list that's stored in here um, that is uh, just linked across the processors. And then there's a, um, but the, the address space, although you can directly read and write anything that's in this yellow part of the region, each processor also has a private part of the address space, which is because it's more efficient to access things that are, are private for various various reasons in the implementation. So, um, but even in the part of the address space that's shared, you can see shared, you can see this dashed line, and that says although it's in the shared space, um, I know that some parts of it are nearby and some parts are farther away, and so I partition up the shared part of the address space in a way that allows me to ask what's what's near and what's far away, but still allows me to access what's directly accessed through, say, a read and a write, um, what is, or what we'll call put and a get, what's remote um, on stored on another processor. Um, you, there's a very, um, so, so this allows you to get the locality that you need for, the, for scalability, so that kind of uh, the same thing that you would get from, say, a message passing, but it also gives you the ability to directly access these irregular data structures without ask, without having to set up necessarily a two-sided communication pattern in advance. Um, there's a very small picture that I see of all of you in the room. So I will ask if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at any, any point, but you might need to sort of wave your hand a little bit more vigorously than, uh, than you would normally do for one of the speakers. Okay, so what does a uh, hello world look like? Um, this is a, this is UPC and we're actually, this is the first time um, that we've given a talk that's really focused more on UPC++. Um, and so I'm just going to give a couple of slides of overview of UPC um, and talk a little bit about some of the applications work we've done in both UPC and UPC++ and then hand it off to Amir to really give you more of a tutorial of UPC++. Um, so this is Hello World in um, UPC, it, written in UPC. So it looks just like um, C code. You have a main function and it's doing a print. Um, there's a couple of keywords here that you can use in UPC, my threads and threads. So these are like um, an MPI or other things, the ability to ask how many threads are there in the world and um, what is the ID. So this is a single program, multiple data or SPMD programming model in the sense that this main function, you can think of it as being started on every processor and it runs until the end of the program on, on all the processors together. So it's um, they, they all work together. Um, there, you, you need to include a header in order to write this and then you need to compile this with a UPC compiler. Um, the, uh, this PGAS means, as I said, being directly to act, um, being able to directly access uh, remote data. So um, what, what UPC has is distributed arrays that are built in. So for example, I can declare a, a distributed array A, which has 100 elements, and they're spread out over the processors. In this particular case, the way it's declared, um, they would this would be spread out cyclically, so one element per processor. Um, there are ways of getting blocked arrays, and there's a bunch of details here in terms of exactly how you do these allocations. You can also do them dynamically, um, but uh, just for simplicity, I'm showing you a really simple shared array. And once you've got a shared array, any processor can then execute this statement A sub 10 is equal to 3, or um, here's a variable, local variable X that's just in the private, so the white part of this dress space that I showed before at the bottom, um, is it gets a value that might be remote. So these are what we'll call a put operation um, in the first case and a get operation in the second, um, and these may be local or remote operations. Um, you can have global pointers, um, which are like, they're like C pointers. You can do the things that, um, oh, I'm sorry, there was a line wrap that I think at some point in the editing didn't 
didn't do very well here, but this is um, a declaration of shared pointer P. And for example, in this case, I'm just getting an address of an array element. So that's an appoint into something that I've already allocated before. And this UPC um, alloc should be part of the comment line there. So there are ways of doing dynamic allocations for say linked lists and things like that. Um, once I have a global pointer, I can dereference it um, on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, do a put or a get. I can also do um, pointer arithmetic on it for better or worse, but that's um, something that was in C. And one of the things that we wanted to do in, C, in UPC was to keep with the kind of spirit of, of the underlying language C. So, so UPC also has locks, it has barriers um, for synchronization. Um, using the, uh, even with this program right here, you can imagine I, I could have a race condition between say the read of, uh, of A sub, you know, A sub 14 and write of say one of these star P things. So you do have to synchronize it as you do in shared memory code. Um, there's also collective communication, which looks quite similar to what's in MPI. So things like broadcast and reductions, although you can also do that sort of on the distributed arrays that are built in. So um, just to kind of one more slide on this, this, this shows a picture of what that what a distributed array um, might look like. And it, um, it also shows, again, the linked list. Um, one thing I didn't mention before is there are actually, if you look carefully, there are two different widths of pointers. There are sort of fat pointers here and there's uh, thin pointers. And um, that's actually the way the implementation works. Um, just to tell you a little bit about what's underneath the hood, a fat pointer is going to be represented by something like a, a thread ID or processor ID that tells you where what what processor it lives on, and um, and then a local address that that um, tells it where it lives in memory on that processor. And um, and and the, whereas a regular old uh, this this thin pointer here L is um, is only allowed to point into the local part of the address the, the this uh, yeah, local part of the address space. Um, so it can be either shared or not, but it has to be on the processor. And that's just a regular old um, C address. So one can um, do these direct write, reads and writes um, uh, on these kinds of data structures. So um, one of the things that's in UPC and turns out to be very important in the applications and will influence the design of UPC++ are um, bulk uh, bulk memory operations. So these will look more like MPI right now, but they are more like the one-sided parts of MPI. Um, these are all non-blocking. So here's a little bit of slightly uglier code in terms of the interface for doing a, a mem copy. Um, this is called, so this would be analogous to a mem copy in C. Um, it's called UPC underscore mem copy NB. The NB means it's non-blocking. Um, and it takes a, a couple of pointers that are uh, pointers to shared part of this address space. So you can mem copy um, into and out of remote processors. And um, what you get back from that is something called a handle, um, which is this UPC handle T. And that um, is something that you can then later synchronize and ask, has that mem copy actually completed? So there are a number of other features um, that this is just giving you a little bit of a, a spirit of what the, uh, the bulk version looks like, which is, as I said, modeled after the kinds of uh, bulk data copies that are in C. So um, dropping into the implementation a little bit more, I mentioned that a global pointer is represented by a remote processor ID of some kind and a local address. Um, in memory, and uh, what that means is that the underlying messaging implementation is a little bit than what, different than what's in a two-sided send-receive model. So in a two-sided model, when you're doing send and receive, um, what you see is the top picture, which is you're sending, say, this is a send operation. There's some data that you're sending. That's the data payload, whatever it is. Um, but I, And on that, among other things, is a message ID. That message ID is something that um, tells you what that tells the implementation kind of how to match it up with a receive operation that's running on the host CPU on the other side. So when this message gets into the network interface, there's information that comes from the program on the other side, which you write as an application programmer, you say receive, and that receive operation says what address that data should go into, right? You give it an address and it'll tell it um, that the, when that message comes in, please write it at this location in the local memory. Um, but the information about the data and where it goes in memory is decoupled. Um, whereas in a one-sided operation, um, which is implemented, for example, in GasNet, which is our communication layer, we use the Berkeley Lab that is underneath our UPC implementation, although there are other UPC implementations by companies and so on. Um, but but this the our, our runtime system, our communication runtime is called GasNet and will also be the runtime for UPC++. 
Um, so when you do a put message, it has an address and the payload, a network interface with any of the modern supercomputers and even with clusters with say InfiniBand um, are going to have RDMA support in the network interface, which means that when this message comes in, the network interface hardware without contacting the host CPU can directly write that into the memory. Um, and so that can be actually more efficient than this other protocol that's used for the two-sided message passing. Um, this is showing some, some performance numbers. Um, this is on the uh, Cori system at NERSC. Uh, this is the phase one system, which is, has the Haswell processors on it. Um, and this shows latency. I should have labeled the y-axis here as microseconds. Um, this is showing the um, MPI latency and the gas net latency. So you can see that you can get some advantages, especially for small messages. When you get to larger messages, there isn't uh, any significant difference. But for small messages, the, the one-sided operations are really closer to what the RDMA hardware is actually doing. Um, does this make a difference in bandwidth? Well, um, typically the bandwidth will saturate the same level. Uh, there's uh, something here in the MPI implementation that's causing a slight difference. But Typically on most machines, these two lines at the, for the large message sizes will, um, will be um, overlapped. But for some of the small and medium sized messages, there can be actually a substantial difference in the, uh, in the overhead and the, the, the um, bandwidth that you get. Um, this is what I call, we call a flood bandwidth test. So I should be careful about that. It's not really just about bandwidth of a single message. This is about trying to send multiple messages as fast as possible back to back of a given size that's shown here on the, um, the uh, x-axis, the y-axis, and sorry, in this case is gigabytes per second. And, um, and so you, it's really about um, both the, net, the, the achievable um, bandwidth across the network, uh, but it's also about how quickly you can inject messages into the network, which is what limits your, uh, the bandwidth for this kind of a flood test. Um, for the same kind of flood bandwidth, I'm just looking across a number of different machines. Uh, historically, this is a blue gene queue at, um, at, there at um, Argon. This is a, a system, Gemini. This is the Titan system at Oak Ridge. Uh, this is the, the, the Cori system at NERSC that I just mentioned. And these are some older systems, including some InfiniBand networks. So these are the percentage of hardware peak that you get um, from both gas and MPI using this kind of flood bandwidth test, um, which means, so this is kind of one of the other maybe um, kind of driving applications is when you have these uh, applications that are more irregular, you tend to have smaller messages and you're often sending more small messages rather than a large number of smaller number of very large messages. So this shows the percentage of the peak bandwidth you're getting and you can see and across all of these machines that you can get better injection bandwidth um, from the uh, gas net implementation. Um, how does this, why does this matter in real applications? Um, so one of the things that was a, a surprise to this, and this is very old work, um, but looks that, that this, this idea is not just important when you have low latency um, messages, but can be useful for even problems that are bisection bandwidth limited. So a bisection bandwidth limited problem is where you, all the processors want to send out to all the other processors at once. In this case, you're doing a 3D FFT, which involves doing FFTs across say, the columns and then the rows. And then in the third dimension, which is going into and out of the screen, um, in order to do that, we transpose the matrix so that um, say all the blue stuff will be stored on one processor. Whereas um, as we initially start out, each of these slabs that you're showing the rainbow slab is stored on one processor. So after we've done the two of the dimensions of the FFT, we'll do a transpose. Um, and there's a number of different algorithms you can use, um, but one of them is to, to minimize the number of messages, which is typically the right thing to do in writing MPI applications. Uh, two-sided message passing applications, send as few messages as possible, and, and therefore they're as large as possible. Um, in all of these cases, we're sending the same volume of data, so the only question is how many messages is that broken into? Uh, the slab implementation is taking, say, all of the blue rows that are on one of these, these planes and sending that as a chunk, and pencil is sending just one individual row. So this was on some of these older machines. You can see the best um, implementation that was written in MPI, uh, this was based on a NAS parallel benchmark um, implementation done by others. Um, the best MPI implementation we found um, was using a somewhat different, uh, this, the, 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 MP, the original NAS implementation was using uh, the first kind of traditional thing, the bulk um, implementation. The second one was using the kind of intermediate slabs one. And the, the last one, which is written in UBC, is using um, the, uh, 
pencils. So when it says always slabs are always pencils, that means in both MPI and UPC, we tried all possible algorithms. And um, in this, on this particular set of machines, we found these two different cases for the MPI and UPC implementations. So what's going on here? Well, the UPC implementation actually is not synchronizing on every individual pencil that's being sent. Um, it's, it basically pushes them all out in the network and uses the RDMA features. And then after everything is done, there's a single barrier um, to make sure that all of the uh, pencils have been uh, sent. Um, this is some data on the, uh, uh, I think that should say Blue Gene uh, Q system, uh, but you can see also some, some differences there, advantages of this approach. So one of the, the things that's happening here is you're sending messages over a larger period of time because they're smaller. You can actually start the communication earlier. So if you have a problem that is bisection bandwidth limited, you want to spread that communication over as long a period as possible and overlap it with communication because otherwise you, you sit and wait for that uh, bottleneck. So another very different kind of application is genome assembly. Um, this is a problem of you're given a, a sequence of A, C, T, and G, so these, these um, strings, and um, the way they come out of the sequencers is in fairly short fragments, and you're trying to glue them together into much larger fragments so that you can um, read the, the, all the genes that are in the chromosomes and so on. So this is kind of like putting together a puzzle where you don't know uh, what the cover looks like. Um, in the human genome assembly, we often do have, we, we typically do have a, a reference genome. Um, so it's a little bit different problem of aligning it against that reference, but for many other species, so plants, fungi, um, microbial communities, uh, we don't necessarily have any reference genome. So it's like uh, putting together a puzzle without the cover. So the way this, uh, is this, this algorithm works is, um, the, and this is a standard algorithm that's also implemented in other techniques. In fact, I think Pavan has worked on one in um, MPI. Uh, and, uh, um, but what's done in this case is um, you chop the, these reads into smaller fragments. In this case, I'm showing it with um, three character fragments called KMERS. So K is the length in, in an actual implementation for, say, the human genome, you might use a length of, of um, uh, 51 or um, something like that. And then you, you take all of these fragments and you put them into a hash table. Um, you think of that hash table as a graph. And what you're going to do is um, you also store in that hash table the left and right extensions of them. And so you can now walk through the graph by looking something up in the ha hash table, looking for its left and right extension, and then looking up the next thing in the hash table, and so on. And um, there's other, a lot of other complexities in this, but that just gives you an idea of why we want a hash table for this. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna build these um, contigs, uh, these longer sequences from it. So this is kind of a, a little picture of what the hash table looks like in a language like UPC, um, which is what our code is written in. Um, so here's the kind of array that is stored with all the buckets. And in each bucket, there's a list which short stores the, um, the KMER and then the, uh, say, the left and right um, extension of it. Um, actually, this is just, uh, I'm just showing, say, the right extension in this picture. Um, this is another thing, that, another KMER that happens to land in the same hash table bucket. This allows us to, to build hash tables that are terabytes or even petabytes of data, which is important for the uh, biology applications. These are some speed up numbers. Um, it was, uh, um, there's some comparisons to uh, both the MPI code uh, Ray that was um, written in, uh, that was running on a, a fixed number of the same number of cores. It was about 13 times faster in that case. There's a lot of IO and other things that mixed into these numbers, um, but certainly the PGAS stuff is allowing us to both um, ex implement, um, kind of think about the algorithms in a way that's quite different than I think you would normally um, come to in a send receive model. Um, so it's more of a one-sided model, which um, I think is also used in, in this, the, some MPI um, implementations. And um, in this case, it also uses things that I didn't really talk about in UBC, such as remote atomics, which is what you want, for example, in the, in the uh, histogram example. Um, here's a bunch of other assemblers that, are, um, that were being used in, pra in practice at the Joint Genome Institute. Um, and uh, how long they took. This was running on shared memory hardware, so these are not equal hardware. Um, the, the ones on the right are all running on 960 cores of Edison. Um, the two on the left are running on um, shared memory machines uh, because that, th those, uh, those assemblers only ran on shared memory machines. Um, I think I'll, I'll skip this, but it has allowed us to actually solve problems that weren't solvable before. Um, and uh, um, I want to say a little bit more about um, UPC and give a couple of other examples, and I'll let Amir talk more about what UPC looks like, but um, this, this example that also is kind of a, a um, 
pattern that we see coming up in uh, applications is um, combining observational data. This is a seismic modeling code, so you have measurements coming from um, seismic meters around the world, and you're running a simulation of what the interior of the earth looks like. What are the materials of that interior? And you're fitting that simulation to the data that you're observing. So there's a, let's say a small earthquake that will measure some, you'll get some um, behavior from that. And you're trying to use that to figure out what is the underlying um, structure of the earth look like? What are the materials? How dense is it? Things like that. So the problem that came up in this case, and it was entirely an MPI send receive collective code that was written in Fortran called libraries such as Scalapack. Um, and, uh, but in this case, the, the one piece of the code that was trying to incorporate the um, observational data had this fairly ugly matrix construction problem where the data was coming in from different processors and needed to be written in an irregular, say, strided pattern to the, this big, large shared matrix. And so this one piece of the code was written actually in UPC++ um, that interoperated easily with uh, Fortran and allowed this code to also solve a problem that hadn't been solved before in terms of the uh, resolution of the, the simulation because when you tried to store this one matrix on a single node, it didn't scale. Um, and this is the efficiency of that code. Um, I'll also just mention this similar kind of pattern comes up in NWCAM in the Hartree Fock example. Um, and we were able to get better scalability. This is relative to a highly optimized code um, called GT Fock that had actually, I think, been a um, had won an award, um, and uh, this is uh, we're, we're outperforming it a little bit in the um, UPC++ code, although they are uh, they are similar. And um, there are other applications such as these hierarchical mesh problems. Um, this uh, data is looking at what happens when you want to fill in. You've got a hierarchy of block structured meshes, which is the right hand picture. Um, this comes up, say, in fluid dynamics codes where you have some complicated part of a fluid domain. You put very fine meshes there and coarse meshes elsewhere. And um, these tend to have communication patterns that are also a little bit less regular and somewhat smaller messages. Um, and uh, th this shows that actually in this particular case, the paper talks about a hierarchical version of UPC that plus plus, which is using UPC plus plus both on the node and between nodes, um, but has a slightly different algorithm between the two, which is something that you can do there. And the last example I'll mention is more of a dynamic task graph. Um, this is a direct solver for um, linear algebra. This was an LU factorization code, and this shows kind of the, ta the graph of tasks that come up in factoring a matrix using LU. So you factor a column, you update a block row. These are all blocks of matrices. And, um, and then you up, use that to update the trailing matrix and then go, uh, then repeat this on the smalling, uh, smaller trailing submatrices. So you can write this in a bulk synchronous style with barriers, say after the bulk row, after the update, and, and after this matrix multiply, um, or you can do it in a task-driven way, um, which is what uh, Perry Husbands did in this UPC implementation. And now um, Matthias Jacqueline did in a sparse version of a similar kind of task graph code um, and this is the, uh, shows the results for the sparse uh, direct solver application. You can see, you may, might imagine that in the sparse case, um, it's much harder to run the bulk synchronous version or it's less efficient because um, each of the, the sub blocks can take different amounts of time to do the sparsity of the matrix. Um, so a common pattern that comes up which will influence the UPC++ implementation is we actually don't use the generality of UPC arrays very much. Um, what we do is build directories which where here's a, a four processor version and the, uh, the shared part of the address space here is kind of turned on a corner just so that I can show uh, the, the, uh, the rest of the data structure here and the, the picture. And so this is four processors. Each one has a pointer to say its own elements, but then I build a directory that has a pointer to every other processor's elements as well. And so in this case, say if I'm doing a 3D structured mesh computation, I build a little tiny skeleton of that 3D mesh on every processor and have it point to all the other processors. Now you can have scalability problems if you if you build a lot of these all to all sort of data structures, but um, you, it's really your choice as application programmer how you want to build the directory. You can also make it something hierarchical. And so I think um, these, these different examples give you some idea of why um, this, the PGAS ideas are useful you want to do, in some cases, fine-grained updates, which came up in the genomics example. Um, you have latency-sensitive al algorithms that come up also in the genomics example. You have a depth for search. You have distributed graph, um, these uh, distributed task graphs, such as in Sparse Cholesky. Um, I didn't mention work stealing that came up in Hartree Fock, as well as the matrix assembly that was in both Hartree Fock and the seismic code. Um, and so some of these medium-sized messages that come up in the adaptive mesh case, 
um, and the all-to-all -all communication. So um, these are useful for these classes of applications, especially I think the more irregular ones are things with finer grain messages and um, also useful because it exposes some of the, um, it allows you to have a single programming model that works within the node where you have many lightweight cores um, and between the nodes where you have massive numbers of, um, of nodes. And you're using the um, RDMA mechanism on the processor, uh, sorry, between the processors, between the nodes um, and in the network. And you're also using what we're seeing increasingly on the, the, the node architecture that you, you may not have cache coherent shared memory, or even if you do, you may have some NUMA model and that, that partitioning of the, the global address space is also useful um, there. So with that, um, I'll, I'll just, uh, these slides are of course available, point you to um, the implementations for both UPC and UPC++ as well as GasNet. Um, and, uh, there's information here you can look at to use it on the both the NERSC and the Argon machines, um, and then hand it over to Amir to talk about um, UPC++. All right, so I'll be talking about our effort to redesign the UPC++ uh, library. And I apologize for being tethered to this podium over here. Uh, normally, I like to present with an iPad so I can walk around and be a little bit more interactive, but hopefully we'll make it work. So the results that Kathy showed you in the examples that um, she demonstrated were from our initial version of UPC++ and just a little bit more detail on UPC++ as an, as, as an idea. It's a library approach to providing the PGAS programming model. Okay, so just like MPI is a library approach. Is there a uh, no, that's okay. So just like MPI is a library approach um, to providing message passing, and of course it does provide some elements of PGAS in terms of one-sided messaging, what we wanted to do is provide a C++ template library that provides the full PGAS model so that you don't, have, you don't have to use a separate compiler. You can use whatever your favorite C++ compiler is. It will interoperate with any other C++ library as well, and you can use the full power of the standard template library as well. Now with the new version of UPC++, it's designed for exascale computing. So that means that it needs to be able to run scalably on very large machines. So it'll be built on top of GasNet EX, which is, again, as Kathy mentioned, GasNet is our communication layer that we're using. And it's used in other languages as well, such as Chapel. GasNet EX is the exascale version that will be scalable to larger machines. Again, a compiler-free approach so that we leverage C++ standards and also be able to influence future directions of C++ as well. For instance, we've been able to influence the, the design of some of the asynchronous um, APIs that are in C++. And we're also trying to influence some of the future directions when it comes to things like managed memory and managed pointers. Because it's a library, that means that you can easily interoperate inter with, with MPI, OpenMP, CUDA, and other libraries as well. And in terms of our design philosophy, it's designed around encouraging highly performant asynchronous computation. So all of the communication operations are explicit, unlike what you saw in UPC, where you could just use a star to dereference a global pointer. In UPC++, we actually make it an explicit operation so that you know Hey, I'm doing something that's actually going to require communication. The second piece of that is that communication is asynchronous as well. So I'm not going to get back. If I have a global pointer of an int, I'm not going to get back an int immediately. What I'm going to get back is something called a future, which is just a standard um, abstraction for representing some value that will become available sometime in the future asynchronously. And of course, we've designed it's so that there's no non-scalable data structures. So things like the UPC style uh, distributed array. With UPC++ as a library, we can't actually rely on there being an aligned heap. And there's also other issues with relying on an aligned heap when it comes to um, subgroups of, of ranks. So instead, what we built is data structures that are actually scalable. And I'll show you that uh, later. So here's a simple UPC++ program, program. It looks a lot like the UPC program that Kathy showed you, except for syntax. So we have our 
UPC++ header that you have to include. And because it's a library, just like with MPI, it must be initialized before you use any of the UPC++ functions. And then you have to finalize it when you're done. All of the UPC++ functions live inside this UPC XX namespace. So again, now we're using a standard C++ abstraction in order to provide the UPC++ features. And here what we're doing is, from each of the ranks, all we're going to do is we're going to print out hello world and then the rank ID. And so the UPC++ function that tells you your rank ID is rank me. And so that'll give back the rank ID and it'll be printed out. And of course, because we don't have any synchronization, the outputs can appear in any order. And even on some systems, it might e they might even be interleaved. All right, so that's just sort of the most basic. UPC++ provides a lot more. We have our fundamental pieces of our API. So that includes things like global pointer, as well as allocating out of the shared space. Um, we have futures, which, which again, represent values that are going to be made available asynchronously. And then we have distributed objects, which are scalable distributed, distributed data structures. We have one-sided communication. Again, those are explicit operations. Those include remote puts and gets, as well as remote procedures calls and non-strided and uh, indexed operations as well. And then we have the ability to construct task graphs using callbacks. Okay, so what I can do is I can actually attach a callback to a feature that runs when that data value is ready. And so that way I can construct some arbitrary task graph and implement algorithms like the sparse Cholesky that rely on those task graphs. UPC++ also has remote atomics, teams which are like uh, MPI communicators, and the ability to control when progress happens. For the rest of this talk, what, I'll, what I'll, I will concentrate on are the fundamental types and the communication. The last four bullet points are more advanced features, which if you're interested in, um, I'll point you to the draft specification that you can take a look at on your own. So sort of the running example that, that we'll use is a simple Monte Carlo Pi calculation. And the way it works is what we do is we throw random darts in space. And so if we look at a unit square that has area exactly one, and if we take a unit circle radius of one that has area pi, and since we're only looking at one quadrant of that unit circle, its area is pi over four. Okay, so if I throw random darts in this one by one area, the percentage of those darts that land inside of that unit circle is gonna be pi over four. And so then that means that I can compute that ratio by taking the number that lands within this unit circle, dividing it by the total number of darts I threw, and that should give me an estimate of pi over four. So let's start with, again, the simplest version where we don't do any sort of cooperation or coordination between ranks. Each rank will compute its own independent estimate. Okay, so as before, we have to start up UPC++. And then what we're going to do is each rank has its own copies of, of the local variables. Okay, because again, with UPC++, what we have is just like with MPI, we have a single program multiple data model, which means that every rank will be running this code. So every rank has its own stack and its own memory space and its own copy of these variables. Each rank also has access to the command line arguments. Okay, so we can pass the number of trials that we want as a command line argument and each rank can go ahead and read that. In this case, what we'll do is just to get some sort of variation, we'll, we'll see the random number generator using the rank ID of each rank so that we don't, we're not just repeating the computation, we're actually doing some independent computations. And then what we're going to do is for the number of trials specified on the command line, we'll throw that dart, figure out whether or not it was within the circle or not. And so we'll do that by calling this hit function, which I'll show you on the next slide. And then we'll accumulate the number of, of darts that landed within the circle. And then at the end, we divide that by the total number of darts that we threw, multiply by four in order to get our estimate of pi. And then each rank will independently print out what they estimated pi to be, and finally we'll finalize the library. 
All right, so what does the hate function look like? Well, in our required header files that we're using in our program, we're using C out and endl, so we need to use IO stream. We're using a lot of things from the C standard library in this implementation, so rand, rand max, srand, a2i. And then, of course, we need to include UPC++, the UPC++ header as well. So a simple version of hit, if you're familiar with C-style programming, is we call our random number generator. That will give us something in the range between 0 and our rand max. We divide by rand max in order to convert that into a double in the range between 0 and 1. And then we check to see if it's within that unit circle. And if it is, we'll return 1, meaning that it hit inside of the circle, otherwise we'll return zero. So this is sort of the basic C style version, and because UPC++ is C++, we can also write C code. But the really nice thing about being a library is that we can also do this in very new and state-of-the-art C++ style as well. So instead of relying on decades-old random number generator, what we can do is use new C++11 features for working with random numbers. So that's within the random header. What we can do is we can declare a random in number generator. And here we're using the default random engine. And then we can tell it what kind of distribution we want. In this case, we want a real distribution over double. So this is actually a template. The default is actually double. So that's why the brackets are empty. And then we tell it we want this to be uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. And then all we need to do now is in order to produce that double value, we call this, we apply this dis, uh, distribution, which is a function object on the generator, and it will give us back a random number. Okay, so again, now here we're making much more use of the C++ template library, including newer things, uh, state-of-the-art things. And that's the advantage of being a library, is that we can take advantage of anything that comes down the pipe in C++. All right, so that version of Stencil, again, we computed independent estimates. Of course, we want to combine all the data from all the ranks so that we get a much better estimate. But in order to do that, we need to introduce some way of communicating between processors. OK, so like with UPC, we also have both private and shared memory in uh, UPC++. OK, so the private memory is accessible only to the rank that owns it. The shared memory is partitioned, so there's pieces of it on each rank, but it can be accessed by another rank, assuming they have a pointer to it. And the kind of pointer to it is, we call it a global pointer. And it's a template. So here we have a glo uh, global pointer of int. So that means that we have a global pointer that's referencing an int. And, that, and again, just like with the fat pointer that Kathy talked about, this includes a rank plus some virtual memory address on that remote rank. In this particular case, what we're doing is we're allocating using this new underscore function that we provide in UPC++. And by the way, from here on out, I'm going to leave out the UPCXX colon colon qualifier. Okay, so pretend that I did a using namespace UPCXX declaration. But I'll still color them in green so that you can tell what the UPC++ names are. Okay, so here each rank is creating. An, an int out of the shared memory space and initializing it to their rank ID. So in rank 0, we have an int that has 0. Rank 1, we have an int that has 1. And rank n, we have an int that has rank n. So now if I hand this global pointer out to somebody else, they can do a read or a write to it. But as we'll see in a moment, this won't be using the star operator because we want to ensure that all communication is explicit so that the programmer knows, hey, this is an operation. It's going to take some. It's going to have some latency, and it's also going to be asynchronous. It's going to be give me back a future that encapsulates the result. Okay, so again, just a reminder: what, what is a future? A future holds a sequence of values. Can be empty in some cases if it's all I care about is notification of the completion of an operation as opposed to a particular value. And then also also has a state: is this ready? You know, has the operation completed, or has it not? And then what we have is we have communication operations that produce these features. Okay, so if I call the rget, which stands for remote git, using a global pointer, it's going to give me back a future that encapsulates whatever 
uh, that pointer is pointing at. Here I put it t as a generic template parameter. And this would be the case if g pointer 1 was a global pointer of t. And then now what I can do is, because this is asynchronous, I can overlap communication with computation by go ahead and doing some unrelated work while those you know, values are being transferred. And then later on, I can do a non-blocking query by calling ready on the future to see whether or not it has completed. Or I can actually block on it by calling wait on it. And what we'll also be doing is we'll be underlying each of the blocking operations. And in this case, wait is a blocking operation, but it's a safe blocking operation in the, in the sense that it's going to be continually polling to see whether or not the value is ready. But at the same time, it will make progress in the runtime layer to make sure that we don't have uh, a deadlock. Once that feature is completed, then I can call result on it in order to obtain its value. All right, so what we used our get there, and again, that takes in a global pointer. And here we're doing a value-based one. There are bulk-based ones as well that will actually transfer um, from uh, arrays and into arrays, into and out of arrays. And then put, we put a value into a global pointer that's a destination. And here we're not getting a value back. We're just getting a notification of completion. So we have an empty feature. And there are several versions of these. Again, there are the bulk versions as well. There's a signaling version that will actually run some code on the remote end once the transfer is completed. And there's also striated, non-contiguous versions as well. All right, so now let's take a look at writing Pi, taking a stab at, at Pi in UPC++ using um, sort of the shared memory. There is a bug here. Actually, there's two bugs here. See if you can find them. So the first thing we'll do is, you know, each rank still gets the command line arguments, but what they're going to do is they're going to decide how much, uh, how many of the trials they're going to run on their own. So we divide up the work evenly, and then we, what we do is we create an integer, and this is that's what this new operation is doing over here. It's creating an integer in the shared memory space, and then we're going to do a broadcast. Now, broadcast is a collective operation; it's a one to all. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that global pointer that we get from that allocation and send it out to all the processors from rank 0. Okay, So every processor will use rank 0's uh, shared int in order to do the accum accumulation. And of course, broadcast is asynchronous. It's not underlined. It will give us back a future. In order to turn that into an actual value, we're going to have to wait on it. Okay. And again, we don't have to wait on it if there are other things that we can do in the meantime. In this particular case, just for simplicity, we'll wait on it. And now in order to actually do an accumulation, again, what you see here is that the reads and writes are explicit. But it's the same operations even if they were implicit. We just want to make sure that the programmer knows what they're getting into when they're actually writing this. So what they need to do in order to do an increment is read the old value. It's explicit. It's asynchronous. It's going to give me back a future. I need to wait on it in order to get the actual value. And then I can put an increment. So call hit, add that to my old number, and then put it back into that shared int on rank 0. And again, it's asynchronous. So here I'm waiting on it. I don't have to do that. I can do this asynchronously and move on to the next one and then you know, do weights at the end. But just for simplicity, we'll block on, on that put as well. Then we have a barrier just to make sure that everyone has completed. And rank 0 at the end will take its, read the value out of its shared int and print out our estimate of pi. All right, so what's wrong with this program? Yeah, so we have. This read and write is non-atomic. And, and that's clear now because of the way that it's, it's, it's explicit. But even if it was implicit, even if, even if the, you were doing this in UPC, it would still be non-atomic because it's multiple operations. Okay, And because we have multiple ranks that are reading and writing non-atomically from the same shared object, we have a race condition. All right, the other minor issue is that we never deallocated that uh, integer, so we have a memory leak as well. But sometimes we don't care about that. 
All right, so we need, we need some sort of synchronization. We've already seen a barrier which, does, which waits until all ranks reach it before proceeding past. That's not enough to ensure atomicity. We also have asynchronous barriers, by the way. So we have a barrier async, which produces a feature, which you can then wait on. So that allows you to do split phase barriers. What we really need to do is we, read, we need to synchronize those updates. And one way to do that is using what's called the owner compute rule. Okay, so the owner of that share object, what I'm going to do, rather than updating that myself, I'm going to send the update to that rank for it to actually do that. And the way that I'm going to do that is using a remote procedure call. Okay, so I'm going to send a function over to the remote end that does the update. And then the remote end, because at least the code that we've written is single threaded on each rank, it's going to process these incoming RPCs synchronously, and that way we avoid that race condition. OK, so what does an RPC look like? It has a target rank. It has a function. And this is a template, by the way, using fancy C++. If you're less familiar with C++, no worries. Just know that you give it a function object and a bunch of arguments. And what it will do is, what this RPC do is it will package up the function and its arguments, send it over to that target rank, which will then unpack them and call the function on the arguments. And if the function returns a value, a function can return a value, right? Well, that gets packaged up in the future. And if there's no return value, if it's void, then it's an empty future. Otherwise, it's a future that contains whatever the result of that RPC is. So here's how we would write the, the Pi code using an RPC. We're going to use a global variable, so not a shared variable. This is only located on rank 0 and is in part of the private space for rank 0. Okay, but it's a global variable, which means that code can actually refer to that even if I'm sitting inside of some anonymous function. And then what we do now is each rank will call the hit function locally in order to compute 0 or 1. Okay, was it inside the, the circle or was it not? And then it will send an update function. And here we're using an anonymous function, a lambda function. Okay, and so that will take in that 0 or 1 as the argument. And then it will increment that global variable, that global hits variable on rank 0 with that 0 or 1. Okay, now because we're sending this as an RPC to rank 0, when rank 0 processes the, the incoming remote procedure calls, that will happen async, that will happen synchronously, so therefore we avoid that race condition. And of course, RPC is asynchronous, so if we want to block on it, we have to call wait, and that will ensure that progress is made, which means on rank zero, it will actually handle incoming RPCs while it's waiting. And similarly, the barrier will also wait until all the RPCs are processed before, uh, before anyone can proceed. All right, so this way, again, we're synchronizing the updates so that we avoid that race condition. Now, that's not the best way to write this code, of course, because we're doing things synchronously. We're blocking on updates. What we really want to do is do independent computations and then do a reduction in order to figure out what the full answer is. Okay, and of course, EPC++ also has collective operations such as reductions as well. So now what we, what we can do instead is we can compute a local sum of the number of hits. And then we can do a reduction over all the processors in order to count globally how many hits occurred. And then processor 0 can divide that by the number of total trials in order to uh, determine the estimate for pi. Okay, so this is really the way you'd want to write this. The previous examples were just to illustrate UPC++ features. All right, one important feature that we alluded to was distributed objects. And again, what we want is a scalable data structure that avoids replicating a linear amount of information on each rank, okay, because that would not be scalable on exascale machines. So what we provide in UPC++ is a distributed object, which you can make out of any C++ type. Okay, what you do is you declare this dist object, and then you give it whatever type you want to, you want to, you want this to be distributed. And on each rank, in whatever team you give it, and you can give it on the team that consists of all the ranks, ranks or 
some subset of the ranks. And what this does is it creates one of these mesh objects on each of those ranks, which now have a globally consistent identifier attached to it. And then another rank can send an RPC that actually refers to that name. Okay, so when that other rank, for instance, sends an RPC and they use this distributed object as one of the arguments of that RPC, what the RPC does is it translates that into a global ID, a globally consistent ID, sends over the ID to the remote side, the remote side looks up that ID in order to get its piece of the object. And if it hasn't even created that object, then it will wait until that object has been created before processing the RPC. And we also provide some syntactic sugar just to do a git on this so that you don't have to actually do this through an R RPC. So if I want some other ranks copy of a counter, I can just call this fetch function on it in order to obtain that. Okay, so an alternative way to write this pi computation, again, this one is not the most performant. It's better than the one with the race condition, but not as good as one with the one with the reduction. What I can do is I can create this distributed object where each rank has its counter, and each rank works on its own counter, and then at the end, rank zero will actually use this distributed object to look up the value from each of the other ranks and accumulate those together. All right, where, where this distributed object is more useful, though, is when we don't have everyone communicating with everyone else. So if I have a nearest neighbor computation, such as a 1D stencil where I need a ghost cell from each of my neighbors, then I can do a constant amount of lookups, right? I can look up the global pointer from my left neighbor, the global pointer from my right neighbor, and then I only have those two pieces of data rather than having a linear amount of directory pointing at every single uh, ranks piece that I don't actually need. So I only need my neighbors. I can go ahead and fetch my left hand, my right hand, and then use them as, as a source of some remote git functions. All right, then again, just a reminder, we only covered sort of the basic features of UPC++. There's a whole lot that we didn't get to, but we do have a draft specification, which I'll, sh I'll have the link on the next slide in case you're interested. We're targeting our first release date for a couple months from now, so September 30th. And the whole idea is we want a library approach that doesn't require using a specialized compiler, but that's also scalable to exascale machines and provides all of the features of PGAS. So there's a link over there. It's funded under the Exascale Computing Projects under the Department of Energy. And lots of people have contributed to this. All right, thank you. <laughs> have time for questions? Take a few. Yeah. So you mentioned the distributed mm -hmm. objects, and I guess uh, it works by sending some tag, as you said, so that you don't actually serialize the object. But is there a way to, if I have a unique set of objects, to you know, pass that unique set of objects, the same type, but different data, so it over to another process? Right. You can always RPC it over. So if I want to communicate something, sort of the most basic way of doing that is I can send a remote procedure call with all the data uh, that I want to send over and, and the function that I want to use to process it. And again, that RPC can target it, that can name a global variable from within inside, uh, from inside of it. So if I know that that remote side has, say, some sort of hash table or map where it's storing this data, what I can do is I can send it over an RPC with the data, and have the actual function store the data that I sent with it inside of the data structure on the remote end. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And we have an interface for serialization that is compatible with boost serialization um, as well. Yeah, so you can write your own custom serialization code for your types as well. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Yeah. So are you providing just the specification or in the example implementation, or do you view your implementation being used? We view our implementation being well, we want it to be highly performant. 
right? So our implementation, our intention is that it to be the canonical implementation. But of course, since one of the things that we're trying to do is influence future directions of C++, we're providing also the specification, which, you know, the way C++ works, it may end up as a technical specification later on, or some pieces of it might end up there. So we're, what we have right now is we have the specification, we have a draft of the specification, we have a draft implementation that we um, plan on releasing within a couple of months, and then we'll be working on improving it and making it more performant. Other questions? All right then, thanks. Thank you all.